Anyways, thank. Let's just do that. In our government, it's infinite wisdom. In '62, there was a, a treaty where our government said we will not have combat troops in Cambodia or Laos. And the North Vietnamese, being the honorable communist dogs that they were, uh, they they just ignored that. And in fact, when our government entered that agreement, they never signed a formal document. I'm told, but we agreed not to send or have American combat troops in Laos or Cambodia. The NVA, North Vietnamese Army, had already been coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which is, you have Vietnam like this. Vietnam to the west would be Cambodia and Laos up north. So this would be Vietnam here, and then Laos and Cambodia. And so from Hanoi, <coughs> they would send down supplies, they would come down the trail, and then it would come into South Vietnam all through here. And um, our job was to go in and see what they were doing. In 64, uh, they established the Military Assistance Command Vietnam Studies and Observations Group, a.k.a. SOG. And uh, we put together missions that would vary from size for recon teams. And uh, the recon teams would be two or three Green Berets with their indigenous troops. That could be Nungs, South Vietnamese, Montagnards, or uh, a Cam some, some Cambodians, not a lot. And what? Chom? Yeah, I, I can't even say it right, but thank you, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I, when I landed in Vietnam, which was 50 years ago from today, uh, we did in-country training myself, Tony Harrell, Johnny McIntyre, we landed after going through training group, and uh, we had in-country training. Then we went north, and uh, at the end of the in-country training, a sergeant comes out and goes, we got a project. Do we have any volunteers? And so Johnny McIntyre goes, well, what are we volunteering for? He goes, can't tell you if you want to volunteer. Well, of course, <laughs> that's Mac V. Sod. <clears throat> so we volunteered, went to Da Nang, and uh, we've been going to classes for so long that they brought us over to a building of the CNC headquarters. We all sat down, we pulled out our pads and pencils, and the command, some sergeant major came said, put those away. And there was a piece of paper there that said, if you're going to volunteer for this project, sign the paper, and then we'll talk about it. And that paper, when you sign it, you agree not to talk about the secret war or anything for 20 years. If you do, you'll be federally prosecuted. And just as a little quick sidebar, after I got home from Vietnam about 20, 25 years after I came home, my dad came by and said, you know, why did those people come by and pick up our trash? <laughs> they were serious about top secret. And there was a, it was a, it was a very tall black dude who would come by, my dad got to recognize him. He came by, regularly picked up the trash to make sure that I wasn't writing anything home about the secret war. That's how serious they were. <clears throat> Anyways, uh, myself, Johnny McIntyre, we land at FOB-1. We get off the helicopter. A recon team gets on and disappears. I don't be arguing with me now. Because <laughs> he was there. Anyways, uh, the recon team was uh, Spike Team Idaho with Glenn Lane, Robert Owen, and four indigenous troops. Um, they disappeared. They never heard from them again. That was my introduction to the secret war. A couple of days later, the troll, Mike Tucker, and Perry. And Steve Perry went on a bright light. 
they got shot up. Everybody was wounded. One of their South Vietnamese was killed, had to leave them behind, and they had an intense firefight trying to find what happened to Idaho. But that was our introduction to the Secret War. And so the Secret War went from 64 to 72. Thereafter, we had some other advisors that were there. And it turns out that the Secret War was the deadliest of all combat across the fence. There's 100% or greater casualties amongst the Green Berets that went across the fence into Prairie Fire was the code name for Laos. Daniel Boone was uh, the targets in Cambodia. And how that would happen would be the Green Berets would either be killed or wounded. We had one, um, uh, Howard, Sergeant Howard, who was received eight Purple Hearts. He should have had 11. He refused three. And he later won the medal. He was not one. He was a recipient of the Medal of Honor for a mission in the Prairie Fire in Laos in 1968. And that was the serious nature of the war. We had, by the time we landed in, in uh, FOB-1, we had three or four teams that had either disappeared completely or were wiped out, or one team, everybody was killed except for the team leader, John Allen from Alabama, who e and E'd for a week and was able to escape and come back. And uh, that was the long and short of it. Now, as we go across the fence, we had no conventional units to support us, no Marines, no Army. We had the best Air Force in the world. We had Army gunships, and we also had the SPADs. Do we say SPADs? Yeah. Airborne. <laughs> we loved our A's. Of course, back then, we didn't know better. So, by the way, you SF guys, be careful. We're in SPAD country now. Do not say A1E. <laughs> I learned it, man. He's been kicking my butt so bad on that. <laughs> it turns out an A1E is a two-seater version of the Sky Reader. So we always called them A1Es because we're just ground pounders. And from our end, when that plane flew, we were at the gun run, we could just see the bottom of it. We could never see the pilots, not very often. <laughs> so it turns out the H model is the one we loved, or the D model, whatever it was. But whichever one was there. Right, whichever one worked. Yeah. But, we got to love those particularly, and one of the reasons why we're here is to talk about our appreciation for what they did for us. Because, and the odd thing about the whole war, we would get into a, a world of uh, shit. I don't want to say shit with all these ladies here, but excuse me, ladies. <laughs> and we'd get into a world, and then they would come save our bacon. We had the gunships that would come, and, uh, you know, one classic mission was October 5th, 1968. We had a, a, a recon team that went in. It was a nine-man team. They had an inexperienced team leader. The team leader walked them into an ambush, which was an L-shaped ambush, where it was like a rise to the right. And he walked them down a trail, and it was a rise, like an L-shape. Well, the NVA, North Vietnamese Army, heard the helicopters drop them off. They had enough time to get that ambush set up. And when they walked into the ambush, a point man and the team leader was killed. Another team member was wounded. And that began a series of firefights for the entire day, where by the end, we lost uh, one King Bee, one Jolly Green Giant. The gunships were shot up. The SPADs took many hits. And one of the SPAD pilots that day, Don Deneen, ran how many sorties? Just one. <laughs> But um, this battle went on. At one point, we had a gunship that came in from the muskets. And they were low on ammo. And the team had killed so many people that they began to stack up the dead bodies. And they were behind the dead bodies every time there'd be a new charge. When they ran out of the bullets of their own, they took the weapons and ammo from the dead, from the enemy soldiers. And at one point, there was another charge coming. And the uh, helicopter came down and hovered in front of the team, opened up with its miniguns, and mowed down hundreds of NBA that were charging towards the team. He left, and in fact, uh, <laughs> this is a tough moment. Today, that pilot is being buried. Dan Cook, the uh, code name, the executioner, they had uh, two pilots, the judge, and the executioner, they were attached to our unit for a year. They flew support for us. 
We got to know each other on a first name basis. And uh, on that day for Lynn Black, they came above and beyond. Two days later, our team had been on the ground, engaged for four hours, and they came out twice with two separate sorties. And the last sortie, they came by so close, we had a king bee hovering, and we were moving to the target, I mean, to the helicopter to get distracted. And they were so close, it was the first time I had shell casings land them back of my neck and burn my neck. That's how close the support came. And uh, just to get back for a little footnote on Lynn Black's mission, 20 years later, America went back for the team leader who was killed. And they couldn't find him. And Lynn Black got a phone call from the general. He said, hi, I, I ambushed you October 5th. He was the commanding officer of the unit that ambushed his team. They chatted for a little while, and then finally, uh, <laughs> the general goes, who was the American with the radio on his back? Because when the team walked into the ambush, everybody went down except for Lynn, because Lynn had a previous tour of duty with the 173rd. He just turned around and started shooting the NVA. They were up on that ridge line. <clears throat> and when I interviewed Lynn, he goes, now I remember some of these guys getting hit, and they would spin around, and I'd shoot them a second time. Well, the general goes, you shot me three times. <laughs> yeah, because cause Lynn was there and says, yeah, you were the guy carrying a radio. You shot me three times. And the worst thing about it was I was lying on the ground watching you kill my men. I couldn't do anything about it. Well, they, ch they chatted a little bit longer. The, the bottom line was uh, Lynn goes, you know, that's a bad day for us. We lost three people out there. And then the general goes, well, I got news for you. You inflicted 90% casualties on us. Lynn goes, well, we saw a flag. We assumed it was a battalion, 3,000 guys. And they go, no, that was the division headquarters. You inflicted 90% casualties that day. So the Air Force, our SPADs, and uh, the team had uh, inflicted those kind of casualties. Those are the kind of odds that we came up against in the field. We were extracted, we, in our case, we were always under fire. The only question was how much fire uh, that we would come up against. Um, so that is the long and the short of it. We had several men, I don't have the exact number, of men that received the Medal of Honor, uh, Green Berets that were in the Secret War. The last one that was awarded was October 23rd, 2017 at the White House. President Trump awarded the Medal of Honor to Gary Michael Rose, who was a medic on Operation Tailwind, which we'll be talking about in a little more detail later. But Doc Padgett's here, and you're the only guy here from our team at that time. Doc was a medic on the chase ship, and uh, he got shot down <laughs> twice. <laughs> and uh, he's part of the living legend from, from that mission. And they have an iconic photograph of the old CH-53 Delta model with guys on the ladder. The guy at the top of the ladder is Doc after they got shot down. So that's the quick introduction to SOG. And we, the recon guys that are here today, we got quite a few here. Uh, can we just do a quick introduction? We got Lou DeSetta, who just came in from Delaware, literally. George Hunt. And then we got uh, Tim Kirk. Very good. And then Ray Frovarp, we ran a little recon. And uh, who else is in the back? Am I missing anybody back here? Paul. Say again. Paul. Paul is a, he was with us with Special Forces, but he was in a thing called Mike Force. And we're going to be talking later about another historic day in Special Forces history. But Paul Longrier is a longtime friend, and he retired as a colonel. And he uh, is of legend from a battle in Lang Vey, which was the first time and the last time that the North Vietnamese Army used tanks against the Green Beret camp. Then we have Spider Parks, my first team leader. Doug, the Frenchman Letourneau, he was on Idaho. George, who had his, literally had his jungle boots shot off or blown off by a hand grenade to try to rescue our team. Tony Harrell from uh, Louisiana. And of course, Doc Paget. And who else? I think we got all our lads covered. Now, just as a side note, we have a medic here who later became a legend as a scuba at school, Richard Rosecrans. So I just got a... Combo. Combo, you sure? Yeah, yeah. But 
anyways, later on, if you want an interesting sidebar, you're talking about the Green Berets who train the SEALs how to be good SEALs. And really, <laughs> yeah, he'll tell them. He's the real deal. Anyways, and so during all this time, you know, we never knew who flew for us. And on rare occasions, I mean, we would go out, our, they would come save our bacon. The, we had spads, we'd get shot down in defense of us. And just to keep the numbers, uh, right today, there are 1,597 MIAs from the, from the Vietnam War in Southeast Asia. In Laos alone, Give me a second, would you, George? Jeez. <laughs> Put a sock in his mouth or something. <laughs> in Laos alone, we have 50 Green Berets to this day that are still listed as MIA, missing in action from the secret war. There's over 100 aviators that died supporting the secret missions. And uh, the government's still ongoing. And uh, next month in San Antonio, uh, Mike Taylor, who is a uh, recon guy is going to uh, San Antonio or Houston for to bury uh, one of our guys that was listed missing in action for all that time. He got shot down flying Covey in, uh, in Laos. So that is why we're here today is to talk about this interchange. We get to meet the SPAD pilots and then we're going to go on from here to where? For one second? <laughs> I, I get the hint. Uh, we're not sure what our schedule is, but you mentioned bright light. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that. And I want George Hunt to come up here for a minute. Oh, yeah. He'll be shy, but come on, George. I did not realize when I was over there, there were men like George Hunt who ran bright light missions. I don't even know if I can tell you that I thought I deserved one if I needed it or would have wanted somebody to risk their life and do that for me. My mom might have a different opinion about that. <laughs> but when somebody went down, whoever it was, whether it's their own guys, whether it's A1s, they sent people in to go out there and try to recover remains, to get what they could off of the sites. I never knew that. First time I went to SOAR, we did an informal talk like we're doing here. And George, I guess we, you got there on time. And we, we were early, but the schedule was anyhow. Uh, so I just started winging some things. And George raised his hand and said, we have a little different opinion about what, what was said about this, but he asked me, um, told me a story about going on a bright light mission that uh, I wish he would talk about a little bit here now, and, uh, and then I'll tell you what happened afterwards. Uh, well, <laughs> close? Yeah. Okay. I, uh, well, there was a break in, in uh, Don was standing pretty close to me, and so I asked him. I had always we I'd run a bright light uh, in August of 1968, and uh, it was uh, I was the fourth team that had gone into that particular target. Uh, the team that the the pilot uh, out of flying out of play coup. And I'm glad to see you guys from play coup here. <laughs> but uh, Wayne Wolf Kyle, I now know his name, but uh, uh, Wayne Wolf Kyle was shot down uh, trying to get our team, uh, to get our team out. And uh, two, we sent two bright light teams in and they were almost, each one was almost overrun. Uh, they were coming up a mountain, up over it, and down the other side to the crash site. And they were coming out of a low area and walking up that mountain. And they, uh, they had, were just 
uh, about overrun, both of them, and they made emergency uh, extractions of them. So I had taught my yards to repel, and they came over and asked me and said, Hunt, do you think you can repel into the top of this mountain and get into the, or repel into the, the, the uh, crash site? I said, well, I'll try. Well, I'll try. I, I think I can. Uh, and uh, so we went up. We had the trees there were very tall. We had uh, two ropes that were long enough that we thought would reach the ground. Because uh, <laughs> it's, it's a big mistake if you get on a rope that doesn't reach the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Big mistake, but uh, uh, we threw those ropes. We threw we threw those ropes out, and they didn't even come close to the ground. Uh, so we had to pull them back in, and uh, then they did with us exactly what they had done with the other two bright light teams. They put us in on the back side of the mountain. And uh, we had, uh, we were chased all day, all day that day uh, as we tried to get to the crash site, and we finally did. But to make a long story short, uh, we were, uh, I, we got into the crash site, we'd been told to bring back uh, small, any, anything with numbers on it that we could carry out, any, anything that had a number on it, and, uh, or, uh, you know, of course, the, any, the pilot or any remains that was there. And uh, we, it was a, uh, they tell you, I, 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 head, hands, were what we would bring out if we couldn't bring the body out. That's what we were told to do. So, because uh, those were the identifiable parts at that time. And, uh, but we got into the crash site. We found pieces of the, air, of the aircraft. We found a charred helmet, a flight helmet. Just this part of it. The top was gone. Uh, we knew the pilot uh, was was dead. And uh, but I we got out of there, and uh, it was a long day. We got out just at dusk. Uh, we were chased down the other side of the mountain. But I had always wondered. I don't know why it was my my teammate, it was his first target. I, that's the other thing, the very first target. He'd never run a target before <laughs> until we got into this mess. And, uh, but uh, the two, we, we both wondered, did we bring back enough that they could identify this pilot? And so I asked Don that day that he was there, I asked Don, I said, is there any way through your connections and your associations, uh, you know, your different organizations, is there any way that you could tell me, find out and tell me if this pilot uh, was identified? Did we bring back enough? Did we accomplish what we went out to do? And um, uh, un unfortunately, uh, it wasn't enough. But uh, that, that they they could identify uh, that they could identify him positively, and uh, we. Uh, that started a chain of events, a chain of events uh, with, with help Don did, uh, Don and, and 
uh, my niece's husband, who's a writer, and he he he, he likes to dig around in this kind of stuff. Uh, he and Don and and a couple of others uh, went to work trying to find the family of uh, to find out who that pilot was and and the family uh, if there was still family. And what they discovered, they, they discovered a, a newspaper article from a, a newspaper in Pennsylvania that uh, they interviewed the, the son, they interviewed the son, and he told them that the only thing that they had ever no one had ever been able to tell them what had happened to their dad. Uh, but the only thing they could tell them was that they had found a charred helmet and some pieces of the aircraft. And I knew when, when uh, they called me and said, we found this article, I said, Oh, well, I'll be darned. This is it. This is him. And I, 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 that had stuck with me for 40-some years in my mind. I don't know why, but it was just, I sat down and cried when they told me. I don't, I, I wish we had uh, been able to, to, uh, to do more to to get more and identify him immediately. But the family finally knew that someone had gone in there and, and had brought out that um, helmet and the pieces of the aircraft. I was very fortunate in being able to bring, bring out to the, the uh, Soar, I guess it was two years ago, two years ago. The pilot's name was Wayne Wolf Kyle. And we brought, I, he paid for the, the travel and I paid for all the registrations and stuff. And we had the family at, uh, at uh, Soar. And it was just a very special part of my life. It, it brought some closure to something that I had thought about all those years that was stuck in my mind. So, but I am, I will say, I am so glad I would like to add just a couple of things. Um, when George first asked, my wife was there with me, and he couldn't pinpoint the time at that point until he talked to the other guy on the team later. So I go to look in the records, and I could narrow it down to three men in this three-month period, all killed in the six SOS. So it wasn't like I just could go into air losses in Vietnam and find that. But I did mention that book to George, and he went and bought it, and he was carrying it around. And then he came to me and said they figured it out. So I didn't do all that much, but I got it started. I had the honor to be there when George received the family downstairs at SOAR, which is a special operations association reunions that we fortunately stumbled into, I did, in the beginning. It's the first time, I guess, any A-1 pilots had ever come out there. It was 13 or 14, uh, 2000, 
13, I think it was. 14. 14. No, yeah, 14. Yeah, 14. 13, and uh, one, I don't want to spend a bunch of time, but I, uh, that happened to me because I was inquiring about a mission, and I sent an email to a person named Robert No, uh, describing what I was looking for because uh, he knew the team leader, and I also saw some photos of him with the team leader. Little did I know he was going to forward this email out to a whole bunch of people on an extensive email list that he had. And uh, I gave him all my information. My phone started ringing. The first guy says, uh, Deep voice, I don't know you. I've never been, a, it wasn't in my time frame. I didn't ever talk to a SPAD pilot before, and I want to tell you thank you. Saved my life. You know. And then I started getting a lot of other emails and contacts. And I thought, whoa, <laughs> what's this all about? And many of them invited me to go to SOAR. So I tried, I said, it's not, this is not me, but I tried to get as many guys as I could from my little unit to go out there. And that started a process that Don Deneen eventually came out and others, and we hope it'll go beyond that. And that's how this whole thing works. But I had no clue, not one clue, that, I mean, that every time somebody went down, a team went out there. And George didn't describe to you that when those guys were coming over the mountains and the six had every airplane that would fly, and he was going out to blow a hole in the jungle because that's the only way they could get out of there, and his new guy didn't tell him at the time you were trying to set off your ordinance, and the whole six opened up and blew the hell out of that mountain and scared him. He thought he blew himself up. <laughs> so that's another aspect of this. There's always so much to the stories. Well, yes, and, and, and so the bright light uh, for mission for us was a, the deadliest of all missions. Many of our guys here ran them. And uh, when we went in, it was all weapons, bullets, hand grenades, maybe a bottle of water, no food. And, uh, and a body bags. And they knew we were coming. And the classic example would be a bright light that the Frenchman ran with Lynn Black in uh, October or September of 69. They had a report of, a, of an aircraft down, had crashed. And in the morning, they came to the team and said, hey, we got a bright light, gear up. So they geared up. They sent the Jolly Green right into CCN compound. They picked up the Frenchman, Lynn Black, and four in Ditch, or six, four, right? <clears throat> they just fly them directly to the crash site. On the way in, they're getting shot at. They get on the ground. Lynn gets on one side of the aircraft, and Doug's on the other side. They're trying to confirm what happened. The four in Ditch surround the plane, and all the while they're on the ground, there's a firefight ongoing with the NVA. They, did, they look at the two guys, and they're embedded into the front of the dashboard of the aircraft. They're so tight they can't get them out. They have some discussions with Covey about whether they're alive or not. They tell them they think they're dead, but they're told they're not medics. They can't determine death. Anyways, they confirmed it enough. When they left under heavy fire, they got pulled down on strings, right? No, we, they, the Jolly Green came in. Actually, we stepped off of the wing back into the Jolly. Okay. And then, and then on another bright light that they ran, when they got pulled out on strings, Doug had one of those memorable moments as the team's getting pulled out on strings, they get high enough, and A1 came underneath with a gun run. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how close things could get. He looked up with this smile. <laughs> he dropped the big old WP right on it. <laughs> yeah. If you all in the back couldn't hear, it's like the pilot looked up at the team that was on the ropes getting extracted from the helicopter on the ropes. Um, before we go any further, how about you SPAD pilots standing up one time so we all see who you are, please. There we go. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Is that, is your, is that one SPAD uh, listed troop here who's doing all the bomb ordinance? Is he here today? Where are you? Okay, well, please, there's, stand up too. You're part of the team. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, yes, we, we loved our A1 Sky Raiders, and those bright light missions were the deadliest of all. Um, for the, uh, our overall war, 
I don't know if you want to go through some of the pictures. And like for here, the picture on the left is Pete Boggs, on the right is John Walton. They got their silver stars uh, for a mission that will condense very quickly. On August 3rd, six man recon team went in into a target in the Ashaw Valley. Um, they got overrun. And the second time they got overrun, the third time they got overrun, the team leader, Pete Boggs, called an A1 Sky Raider gun run on his own team. The NVA were so fierce in coming through, literally they would come across the team. On the third one, he called the, uh, the gunship in with a 20 mic mic gun run. The A1 pilots did what we asked them to do. And uh, Tom Cunningham was the radio operator. Two 20 mic mic rounds hit him. One hit him in the radio on his back. The shrapnel severely wounded the team leader, Pete Boggs. The second round lifted him off the ground and Tom Cunningham was the radio operator. And Tom had an out-of-body experience where as he's flying through the air without the greatest of ease, he could see his body flying through the air and the sinews holding on what was left of his leg that had been severed with a second round for the 20 Mike Mike. He landed, he called out his name, Tom, and then he went back into his body. That's when John Walton went to work, passed him up, a King Bee came in, flown by Captain Tin. The King Bees were South Vietnamese Air Force pilots. They worked with us for our missions across the fence, out of FOB-1 at least, and two, three, and FOB-4, we had uh, the South Vietnamese Air Force, they put us in. More importantly, they came back to take us out. In the Air Museum here, there's an H-34 that was once flown by the South Vietnamese Air Force, and please note the bullet holes in it. That's the confirmation that it's the King Bee. On this mission, uh, the King Bee came in, picked up uh, Pete and Tom Cunningham. They left because the elevation was so high, they knew that the helicopter couldn't carry six men. Helicopter left, the second one came in, got shot out, the third one got shot out. The first pilot, who was more experienced, came back and landed, picked up John, and this time, uh, the other two in ditch, the dead, team member they left behind. And because of the heat, the King Bee has struts to come down with wheels on him, and he picked up the back of the helicopter and flew downhill, got enough lift, and again, they're getting shot at from both sides. Our guys are in the helicopter firing at the bad guys. They lift off, but they don't have enough lift to leave. Just had enough lift to get over the trees. He dipped down into a little valley, all the while under fire, getting more airspeed then finally lifted up, came back, and uh, took him to the hospital, where uh, Tom Cunningham went on to live a successful life, had two children, a beautiful wife, and uh, just got done doing a tour of duty on the board of directors for the Special Operations Association. Pete uh, passed away several years ago. The gentleman in the middle is Charles Borg, who that day received the Silver Star for another mission that he's too humble. I'm still trying to get him to tell us more about the story. But uh, more pictures from here, or? Now some of these pictures, these are the ones you brought over? Oh. Some of them I've never seen. <laughs> so this is a, an awards uh, service at FOB1. In the background are the barracks of the indigenous troops. And uh, we have, you can see some of our little, we call them the little people, because the South Vietnamers are smaller than most of us. In fact, when I came on my team, when Spider Parks introduced me to the team, <laughs> the team there took one look at me and he turned to the interpreter and said, he's too tall, his feet are too big, and he looks stupid. <laughs> yeah, and I, I confirmed all those suspicions. <laughs> It took, needless to say, it took me a little while to earn his trust. But anyways, <laughs> I'm not sure who this gentleman is. Spider, we can just, but anyway, we're, these are FOB1 photos mostly. So just go ahead and we can click forward here. Okay. Sir. Explain that the other FOBs had much similar <laughs> well, every good operation's got to have at least one Marine. 
<laughs> Thank you, Lee. And so these are some of the photographs from FOB1, and that's true. All, when we, in 68, uh, there were six FOBs. FOB1 was Fubai, two was Kantun, where, where Doc was. Then three was at Quezon, which you'll hear much more about later. FOB4 was Da Nang, five was Bami Tuat, FOB6 was Honok Tao, which was northwest of Saigon. And five and six, that's where they ran only targets into, uh, into Cambodia. And this is another one of our unique, distinguished gentlemen, that would be one, maybe under the influence of alcohol. We're not sure. <laughs> Moving forward. <laughs> that looks like Steve Engelke. No. Well, okay. Ray Khan. Ray Khan. And he is standing up there on the King Bee, getting ready to talk to the pilot. And the South Vietnamese, their pilots flew on the right side. I'm told that in Slicks, the pilots were on the left side. So... Um, Continue move forward. Oh, we got a dramatic impact here too? <laughs> and here some of our guys are looking south or to the north. And we have uh, uh, B.S. Rodney Hedman there. And uh, we're just checking out the minefield because as you look north, we had, we had a French minefield and then a minefield that our uh, special forces had put in for security purposes at FOB-1. On the left would be Highway 1 that ran north to the way, back to the Air Force. And this would be, I think this is ST New Jersey, with Ron Zeiss taking the photographs on these. And in the background, you can see the repelling tower. And uh, has some embarrassing moments up there with spider parks, but he saved my life. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said on that. <laughs> What you see here is the Ken Burns effect. We get a picture yeah. and we scan on it, blow it up, blow it in. But you've done good, Lee. Thank that you. Minefield out there, we found the overlay of it, and there was a signature on it that said Charles de Gaulle, second lieutenant. <laughs> 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 Afternoon barbecue, and it got a little out of control. But that's past the, past the minefield. <laughs> and I don't know if this is Bob Gullett. This might be Bob Gullett, who just passed away last year. And he ran recon out of FOB-1 and then later out of FOB-4 with the indigenous troops in the background. You can see the ubiquitous urinals and uh, some of our trucks. And this is the back of the clubhouse. This was our Sergeant Major Harris, who was the Sergeant Major at FOB-1 during 68. And he had been up at Quezon, too, a little, right? I think he spent time at Quezon. Some of our uh, security troops. And in the background, you can see one of the King Bees with the camouflage paint. And this is um, at the front gate. I closed that gate once. Yeah, the last, he was the last one to close the gate for the last time. <laughs> Well, you know, the King Bees were very uh, flamboyant pilots. They were very good. So when we flew to, up to uh, FOB-1 for our first flight up, uh, myself and Johnny McIntyre you had a, a door on the right. So you enter the aircraft. McIntyre and I were over here, and John Hutchins was sitting by the door. And when I got on, I saw the, the door gun. I got to go. So something I thought was going to happen, but I wasn't sure. Anyway, we flew north, and as we were flying north, parallel to Highway 1, FOB 1 was on the east side of the highway. So we're just flying merrily along. All of a sudden, the aircraft literally turned on its side and began to turn as they, they could do this. And this was my first real ride in a helicopter. <laughs> so you imagine, I'm sitting there. All of a sudden, I go from sitting and looking out and enjoying this pastoral scene to looking down at Highway 1. It was sudden. <laughs> and McIntyre and, uh, and John Hutchins was like, Jesus! <laughs> Centrifugal force kept us in the aircraft, but that was our welcome, uh, our first real King Bee ride. So they, they turned on our side, came around, and they did a 360 and landed. And as we, we got off, and that was our introduction to life with the King Bees. Because when they inserted us into a target, the slicks would often come in straight at treetop, set us down. 
the king bees. Oh, this is the troll. I, I, I can't alibi for you, buddy. You're drinking a little bit here. I never dressed like that. Black shoes and black socks and black shorts. He don't remember a thing. He was so drunk. This is an optical delusion. So, uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> this is the troll <laughs> before and after, but his knees are in better shape now than they were back then, right? Wow. Yeah, <laughs> and this is the real troll that we all came to love and know. And this was after he had healed from his injuries on the bright light from the wounds he received uh, going in looking for ST Idaho. This is on our firing range. He's holding the CAR-15, which was the ref weapon of choice for the recon uh, men. It's a variation of the M16. It has a shorter barrel and a collapsible stock. And that was the weapon that all of us carried. Um, and on the end, that's not a suppressor. That's a flat Yes, that's, it's a different flash suppressor uh, on the end of the CAR-15. And uh, moving right along. Oh, yeah, he's, he's still good looking, George. <laughs> <laughs> and this is one of our business troops just back at FOB1. And so with the king bees would insert you into a target, they would spiral. And they would go into auto rotation. And at the last second, they would put the power and you would land. And uh, that would give you, as the, as the team leader going in, because the team leader would sit in the door and behind it would be the, his counterpart. One would look into the jungle for enemy the other would look down to the LZ to see if there were bombs or anything that we didn't want there. On one occasion, when we were spiraling into a target, my uh, uh, counterpart on my team, the Vietnamese, told me, stop. He yelled to the door gunner, and they can't be pulled out. He saw a tripwire. Somehow he'd seen it across the LZ and had to descend it down. We would have ignited a 500-pound bomb. He saw the tripwire, he pulled us out, and then the A1s came back and hit the target and it not ignited a 500-pound bomb. So that was one of the techniques and one of the other challenges we faced in the area of operations. So again, this is back at FB1 with some of the team rooms. This is our clubhouse, the Green Beret Lounge. And this is right on the corner. Uh, as they back up, on the, right behind it, they had built a special barracks for um, the muskets. And that was the one helicopter unit that was attached to us for the entire year of 1968. They were at Camp Duck early on. Then they flew support for us and many missions. And uh, again, today, Dan Cook is being remembered at the Air Force Academy. <laughs> I'm not sure who we have here. And so and this is now we're looking to the west. And this is part of our football field. It was a little uneven sometimes. <laughs> if you look closely in, this, in that building there right behind the truck, that is the S4 shop. And there's got to be one dent where Spider Parks through a pass, realizing that me and that ball were going to collide there. You might see the dent where my body impacted. <laughs> And down here, this is our trail, there's, there's a formation of the indig, and we had our barracks on the right. Here is the actual uh, medic center. Dispensary. Dispensary, please. Thank you, Boxy. And these are some of the gunships that are on standby, or, yeah, or the spads. Might be a common... I'm sorry, gunships or the slicks. Here on the left is Ron Zeiss from New Jersey. On the right is Rick Howard, and they ran uh, with the uh, Spike Team New Jersey. This is our team who's where the Americans lived, and right a hooch or two up is where Spider and I hung out for, together for a few months. And uh, yeah, Ron Zeiss and I got to hang out together a couple of years ago. We won't hold that against you. <laughs> <laughs> so this is right in the team area, and uh, th Rick has his knife 
the wrong way, but that's okay. Here's one of our 50 calibers for camp defense that uh, um, we kept in high maintenance because we never knew when they were going to come for us. They, they mortared us a few times with FOB1. Spider Parks, we had a little bit more hair. <laughs> A little bit, standing in front of the ST Idaho hooch, uh, the Dakota. Okay, now, oh, he, he could, he's one of the, because he's got spider parks with a name like that, is more Apache blood than gringo, and he could throw anything. Axe, pickaxe, shovels, but he can make them stick into a telephone pole. He's a, he's a, well, I was going to say something else, but I won't say it. <laughs> but he could do it. <laughs> and these are just the trench lines. Comanche, yes, Ralph, well, sorry, I apologize. And here's the trench lines at FOB1. Again, we're looking north. And um, during our time there, we had fairly good security, and we only had a few alerts. And the few alerts we had, they never attacked. Yeah, we got fill, we got sandbags. We did fill <laughs> plenty of sandbags during the monsoons in particular. This is one of our maids, Mama San. And uh, say again? You sure? Yeah. And uh, she's guilty of stealing my uh, underwear. <laughs> when I went to Vietnam, I had those uh, jockey shorts, you know, and they kept disappearing. I was down to my last pair. So finally, she's walking out. I just pulled it down a little. There they were. And I said, well, Lynn Black said we shouldn't wear underwear and socks. So it all worked out. <laughs> <laughs> so again, we're looking north. This is the village of Fulong, and we would go out. Uh, sometimes at night we'd pull ambushes for in-country ambushes, particularly in May and June. And this is the football the tournament going on here. Ron Zeiss is back, Roy Kahn, and the guy in the white, well, we don't want to talk about him. But you can see this is one of our action pictures, a little bit out of focus. And John Walton, by the way, his most serious injury he had in Vietnam, he hurt his foot playing football. <laughs> After that one mission, he had a, a third degree cut across his arm, which was from a bullet from the firefight he was engaged in. Um, but that was, that was it, very fortunate. Um, this is our officer's quarter with one of our requisitioned Jeeps probably. It looks freshly painted. <laughs> Another formation, this is a Sergeant Major Harris. Roy Barr was back to us. Some distinguished gentleman in the back, the guy with the sunglasses, is uh, John Peters, and then Cortez. No, that's uh, Allen. No, 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 right here. Anyways, John Allen. Oh, I'll, I'll take your word on that. Moving right along. Some other people in the formation. And again, these are our team hooches in the back where we were segregated. The Greek Special Forces men had their own hooches. And here's Rick Howard again in the center, Ron Zeiss on the left, and uh, New Jersey was ready to be taken out either for a practice uh, target run. I'm not sure who the captain is. This is our team, Hooch. This is uh, Hep and the sunglasses. Uh, New Yong Kong Hep, Spider Park's best part, the best side of Spider, and on the right cowboy. was Cowboy. And he, Cowboy was on the uh, October 5th mission with Lynn Black. And he had run some other missions, and then um, just a st strong, combat, tough veteran. He was, on my first he was on the first mission with Letourneau. Was, Cowboy was he one of the, did, did Cowboy come from North? We had several North Vietnamese that in 54, their families came south because they didn't want to live with the communists. And Cowboy was one of those who so came south and was on our recon team, was just an outstanding warrior. Steve Perry, uh, one of our medics. And, uh, right, and he lives up in San Jose. Right. Yeah, San Jose, on the way to San Jose. Spider Parks was uh, on a fashion display for, for jungle hats. He's just always making a fashion statement in one sort or another. And this was uh, Richard, you're one zero. Childress. Childress. And he was the team leader for ST Virginia. And he was on a mission when Doug Letourneau went in on a mission. And his first mission was um, where he took a break. And 
some NVA came up and shot him in the back four times. And his radio caught the four rounds. They went through the radio, went through all his clothing, and each round made a mark in his back. And it put him on his face. And by the time he bounced back, the NVA were gone. And so Childress was the team. Here's another picture of Childress uh, with his hat. Anyways, he's picked his nails or something. But uh, on that mission, after he got shot in the back four times, he bounced back. The team got out. On, they were extracted on strings. He got wounded with the uh, shrapnel wounds from the B-40 rockets that they're shooting at him with. And um, that night when he took a shower, his back was stinging, and then he felt his boot. He had the four bullets that shot him in the back had gone down his pant legs because his pants were taped into his boots, and he had the four bullets that shot him in the back. <laughs> Now, not you know, back then, he wasn't in the silver nears. He just dumped the bulls out, <laughs> took the shower, and went to work. Today, those bulls would be worth quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, they're still there. <laughs> so, um, is there any way we can speed up the pictures? Okay. This is Mike Tucker, who was your one zero. They took turns being one zeros. And he was also wounded on the rescue mission for Idaho and, um, and I'm sorry, in the bright light. Thank you. Sergeant Major Harris again on the right with one of our interpreters, George, and uh, he spoke very good English. George, yes. And uh, somehow a bullet went through his foot and he couldn't run missions. Uh, black label with Steve Perry carrying said same. Stupid. <laughs> Medication. Medication. Well, he was a medic. <laughs> now here's a good portrait of our King Bee with this uh, uh, camouflage paint. This is out on the launch site, across the road uh, from FOB1. Well kept, George. <laughs> so what? Black, black paint and uh, duct tape. And so we have at least one of our King Bee pilots here. And from here, uh, we would uh, gear up and launch into targets that would go across the fence. Ron with a couple of his team members. And uh, like when our team replaced uh, people that got lost in the May of 68, we hired them young. We, had, we hired two guys that were 15 years old that, that turned out to be really good troops. Again, Ron with another team member. I'm sorry I don't know his name. and yet another team member from New Jersey. <laughs> this is Henry King, who ran several missions uh, out of FOB1, and he was with me on a target where we repelled into a target, and when I got extracted, um, I did hook in my D-ring. This is in front of the clubhouse again, and uh, I got turned upside down, and Henry was in the helicopter. I gave him the sign, get me down, get me down. And the King Bee went down. And uh, what had happened, we used to have a Swiss seat. So the Swiss seat went down on my knees and then it went down on my feet. So I'm hanging upside down. All my gear was just choking me out. And fortunately, Henry King was there telling the pilot to go down. And right before I passed out, my life flashed before my eyes. And I saw the headline in the paper, local boy dies in Vietnam. I go, damn, I died in Laos. <laughs> anyway, I didn't die. Uh, Don's question was: um, occasionally there would be there would be individuals who uh, couldn't run or couldn't perform in the field. Um, like in the case of Lynn Black, the other American on that team prayed during the entire day. That entire time on the ground, he prayed. He never fired a bullet, never threw a hand grenade, and he accused the black of being crazy. But <laughs> black got the rest of them out for that mission. So when something like that happened, if there were individuals who didn't measure up, this happened on occasions, and we would deal with it internally. First talk to a team leader who knew what was going on, and then go to the sergeant major, and quietly get that person transferred to another duty. 
because you didn't want people in the field who would get hurt. Now, sometimes we had people that ran so many missions that they would get burned out. They knew they were getting burned out. So they would say, hey, take me off. And that was always the case. We, it was a volunteer assignment. If you wanted off, you got off. And then usually uh, when you had a tour of duty, near the end of it, you could request duty that would be less combative. And we had some guys that, like Lynn Black, the Frenchman, troll, who ran from beginning until end. So that was the way that would be handled. Yeah. Well, I couldn't get a job anywhere else. <laughs> well, well uh, Spider's being very hard, but what, what Spider said, well, he's picking on himself a little bit. But with us, we had Ford Air Controllers. Their code names were Covey. And so you had an Air Force pilot that flew a Covey that, uh, in, our, in 68, we had mostly O2, slow moving, two twin engine aircraft and it would have the Air Force pilot, but they'd have a Green Beret who had time on the ground so that that Green Beret would know what was going on, what it was like on the ground, so that when situations arose, they could bring their expertise in, talk to the Air Force, and then the Covey uh, pilot would then coordinate the air, which again, it would be anywhere from Air Force fast movers to our beloved Sky Raiders to gunships. And we also had Marine gunships from Scarface. Um, they had Cobras later, but in the early days, they had the uh, old B or D models that could barely get off the ground. They literally put wheels on the ends because they'd be heavily loaded and they couldn't lift off. They, the door gunners would get out and push it to get them going, <laughs> trying to get the helicopter off the ground. But they always, <laughs> but they always came. And uh, this is another team member from New Jersey. And so the uh, Marine Corps uh, lost several helicopters. They supported us. Uh, during that secret war. And you know, we always today, when we're stateside, the Marines pick on the Army, they don't even recognize us. And we pick on the Air Force, but I'll tell you what, when you go across the fence, it's us versus them, never any inter-service rivalry. Uh, this is an interesting shot of laundry. <laughs> right, it is another, right. There they were, just Henry King again one more time. Is that Shippen? Yeah. I didn't recognize him. Yeah. So it's one of our SF medics, Robert Shippen. And the medics ran missions also. Right. And we always. Flying the chase chopper. Right. So we, and like John Walton was a medic that ran with Louisiana. So we like to always try to get some medics on the team, but we didn't have that many in camp. And again, this is just guys pointing at the fire. Here we're back at the range. Rick Howard at the top, the troll. George Sternberg, and many of our indigenous, sometimes we take two or three teams out at once yeah. to go out to the range, and then we do practice different weapons, <coughs> tactics, yeah. and, we, and we went through, uh, when we got to the range, we do those drills over and over again, so that if you made contact, you didn't have to think about what you had to do. Everything from uh, magazines, replacement, and our tactic, if we made contact, we would peel back, and we had it set up so the team would do it quickly, efficiently, and try to get fire superiority over the enemy. And this is where it all began. Like in my case, I was green. I was just a green as grass, uh, green beret. Spider took us out and ran us weary with these drills over and over again, and it paid off. Whenever when we made contact, our little people and uh, always got the first round off in the firefight. A Chinook, they would fly over our camp in the morning to wake us up. <laughs> they left early and they took great joy in that. This is just a, a night at the clubhouse. On Sundays we have steak nights. We go down, our guys would get a flag, a Vietcom flag, blood it up, a little chicken blood, give it to the Navy, say, hey man, we got this combat flag. And look at that, we got that Viet Cong blood on this thing. Give us some steaks. That's 500 steaks. Okay. <laughs> this is the floor show. And uh, enough said about that. Oh, there's the troll supervising things now. <laughs> He's in charge of quality control. <laughs> the same fire we had before, a different angle. 
Oh, here's Troll looking for his magazine. <laughs> <laughs> and Rick Howard in the background. And again, we're on our hills. That was nobody could get hurt out there. Now, Rick, uh, well, need us. this is our urinal. <laughs> we had him outside. So for you, just in case. Now here's uh, Master Sergeant Ross engaging one of our performers at the nightclub. And uh, on one mission, we had to insert uh, Air Force sensors into the Ashaw Valley. And Sergeant, Master Sergeant Ross came with our team, and we put him in uh, the Ashaw right along the trail. There was a main unit, and then it had coaxial cable that went north and south. And uh, Spider was the one zero. We brought Ross along for our uh, expertise, along with Dan. Um, with the, uh, I'm trying to think of the, anyway, we had another guy on the team. That's Daniels. That's Daniels, thank you. And so he came along on our one mission with us on that. Again, we're back at FOB1. George with another team member. Oh my God, to clean up the unit. <laughs> What's with that? So, um, by 1969, the early part of 69, they combined some of the numbers. Uh, Quezon was closed. This is the city. That's okay. Well, there might be another couple in this batch as we go forward. Right, okay. Lucy and I were there last year. So uh, in 69, we combined the FOB. Uh, Quezon was closed. They opened a little small one called Mylock, and Clyde Sincere went up there with some of our guys. And uh, FOB 1 stayed at Fubai. Contum was FOB 2. That became CCC. And then at the end of 68, Fubai was closed. Mylock was closed. We all went down to Da Nang. We had CCN there. Contum became CCC and they consolidated FOB 6 and 5 at Bami Tuat. And down there they had the Air Force that flew their uh, slicks down there, and they were the primary insert. They had mini guns on their crews, and they were outstanding gunships. Um, the Green Hornets of the 20th Special Operations Squadron. And uh, we were down there TDY for three targets. And uh, our first target, we were down there, we got our briefing, and the CO was there, along with the S3, he said, this one's a little different. He said, uh, we got three NVA divisions that are MIA. The first, the third, and the seventh NVA divisions are missing in action. It's like, think about that. That's, that's 30,000 men that the CIA, the DIA, and anybody else, any other three-digit letter couldn't find. So we looked at intel reports, and uh, we, we talked it over with the S3 officer. And on that night, when we did, we did a detailed briefing at the night, they came out with pictures that were obviously photographed from much higher than anything I'd ever seen. This is 1968, before we had satellites. And they had these pictures that were of Cambodia. And you could tell details of the land. And this was part of our intel report. At the end, I asked the CO, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Drake, I said, where do these pictures come from? He says, don't ask. But we had the pictures. Long story short, we inserted, and we were very fortunate. We, we landed on the ground. They had a great insertion from the uh, Green Hornets. We marched for a while. We walked into a base camp. There were still fires burning, still some smoke. One had still had a pot on it. And what had happened was, uh, one of the divisions had just left, and another division was coming in, and our six-man recon team, I mean, the recon guys were really good to us that day. We kind of walked into the base camp in between. Well, shortly thereafter, I had one of those images that I'll take to my grave. We saw, and this is Cambodia, so vegetation wasn't triple canopy like we had in Laos. Laos, you had mountains, triple canopy, which would be 150 feet, 
and it was, uh, that's why we had to have the long ropes. But in Cambodia, it was flat, at least this part of Cambodia. And we were uh, inserted, get to the target, and then they start coming for us. And we could see several hundred yards away. And we could see NVA with their AK-47s, that port arms, their pith helmets. The division has sent their tail element, and the new division has sent their point element, again, at port arms, running to find us. They found us, and they came at us, and we had Claymore mines with five-second fuses. We went back to the primary LZ, and the, fortunately, the Green Hornets came back, because they came at us by the hundreds, and the Claymore mines blew them back, and on the last one, we ran out, got in a helicopter, and just literally coming out of the jungle, we're blowing them back into the jungle when we extracted. And so the good news was we found two of the divisions, and that's, and, uh, and that was Thanksgiving Day. Yeah, they found us. That's bad news. <laughs> but fortunately, we were lucky enough to get out without casualties. But the other sad note was in Cambodia, we had no A1s. We felt very naked there. But the uh, 20th, uh, they had the gunships with the miniguns, and they were really great with flat terrain. But again, it was different not having our beloved A1s there with us. There, there we, we uh, I was at FOB6, FOB6 Honak Honak Tau, Tau, and we launched out, out of Budop. Budop. And they had a little, had Air, a little Air Force base, base. we had an A camp that was next that was to, next to or near that airstrip that, air that, that had been overrun earlier. There were never any ones in Cambodia, but there were any ones in Cambodia. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they had the tri border area, which the, some of the worst uh, CCC targets were located. They had the tri-border, which was Laos in Cambodia, right next to Vietnam, and they had many nasty targets in there. And these are just some more of our troops. And um, I'm trying to think. No, there's one other point. Well, Cambodia will just go give us the lead into Operation Tailwind. In Cambodia, in uh, September of, of 1970, uh, Premier Sihanouk had been ousted in Cambodia. And so the North Vietnamese pushed from Laos south into Cambodia. At that time, the CIA into Laos had its own secret war ongoing at the time. And they had a 5,000-man CIA force fighting the NVA, and they, could, they were getting their clock cleaned. So who do you call when you're losing the battle? When you're the CIA, you call SOG. Who did, who did SOG call? They called uh, Hatchet Force at CCC Contum. They were very fortunate. They had a Captain Gene McCarley, who was a veteran of running recon. He ran recon. He had run other missions with the Hatchet Force. And the Hatchet Force would be, could be a uh, platoon or a company size element. In this case, they took B Company from uh, Contum, 16 Green Berets, one medic, and 120 indigenous troops. And their mission was to go into Laos beyond the regular area of operations. It went further west than any operation had ever gone before or since in SOG history. The team was inserted. <clears throat> the first night on the ground, they made contact, and the enemy had fired one B-40 rocket into the command post wounding Gene McCarley, the medic, Mike Rose. To this day, he can't quite close his hand the right way because of shrapnel wounds from that round. He also had his boot severed, and he wound, a serious wound at the top of his foot. And Gene McCarley said he watched Mike get an ace bandage, wrap it around his foot, and continue to march for the next four days. They had one in ditch who was killed, three were seriously wounded, and Mike worked on them. And the three that were seriously wounded, they had to put together uh, improvised stretchers, and they carried him. For the first day, they tried to carry the dead soldier, but it was too much. They left him behind, had a small, quick service. And in this case, the mission was to go in and divert attention from the CIA. So Gene went in, 
So instead of going in and having an operation stay in one location, Gene moved day and night. Again, they did this with superior air coverage. Our A1s were there, and this is where um, yesterday we were talking, talking about Mel Swanson, who was the leader of the A1s at that time. Marine Scarface, they had the Cobra gunships there. Uh, we had Air Force Facts. At night, Spectre was there, the C-130 gunship. And uh, they had, at the time, the four miniguns. Each minigun could fire 6,000 rounds a minute and they could locate that on the team. And, and the enemy would engage them at night. It would be different degrees of attack, but it was ongoing effort. So after that first night, Mike passed everybody up, the most seriously wounded. He had uh, an indigenous troop who was with him, who he's beginning to train as a medic. He helped him, and they moved. They were able to move the troops, and he used his CAR-15 as a crutch. Because, he was, because of his wounds in his foot, his leg, and his hand. They were moved for two days. On the third day, in the morning, right, Doc? They planned to go in, with the, and they used Marine Corps CH-53 Delta, which was the biggest helicopter, because they were so far in country that a UE and a regular conventional way of inserting could not get the men out there, and they were big enough to carry more men. And on the way, by the way, on the way to the target, they were getting shot at, and they took wounds. They had wounded personnel in the helicopter. When the helicopters left after inserting the team, they had wounded already on the ship. So on the third day, Doc was a, uh, the uh, chase medic on a CH-53. He was going to come in to pick up the most seriously wounded. The pilot brought the helicopter in, and they lowered the tailgate on the back, and Mike Rose was just lifting up a wounded troop to dock. And the last second, they got hit with enemy fire. The pilot pulled out. Mike took the body back. And um, that CH-53 crashed and all rotated in without killing anybody. All of the people got out, and the chase medic came in and picked them up. But they had to use a ladder. And one of my favorite stories with Doc. <laughs> They have a ladder that came down and had these young troops that were Marine Corps, and uh, they had never been trained on a ladder before. So the ladder comes down, Doc knows what it is because he's been trained on it. He says, go up the ladder because there was enemy troops around, so he was concerned about the security. So nobody went up. So finally Doc says, follow me. He climbed the ladder, and they climbed the ladder, and they followed him out. <laughs> but there's an iconic uh, photograph of that. It's a little bit blurry from a distance, but at some point during today or tomorrow, we'll have that. If, if not, there's in the book, Saw Chronicles, we have it captured there in the book. Um, so, uh, I think we may have a lunch ready for us, I'll check on that. For people who have, are the guests here at the museum that belong to our group that have, uh, have the passes, we'll have the lunch. Uh, after that, we'll probably continue this, pick up a little bit sure. with what you're talking about. I hate to stop any of this at this time, but um, I, I, I'll need to check on that if you give me a minute just to verify that they're ready for us. And then I'd just like to say one other thing. We had this little argument out at uh, SOAR with each other about who had the most dangerous job, you know, the pilots or these guys. So they play this little game, and of course the argument is that neither side wants to win, or will allow them to. But are there any pilots in here who think they had a dangerous job, more dangerous job, and flew for any sixth or Ola or anything else that these men had after the things you've been hearing here today? So I'll leave it with that for a second. You can go ahead and for a minute here, Till, and I'm going to see what, what the deal is. Okay, fair enough. Yes, sir. Please. Just, uh, yeah, thank you. Just uh, a little detail on that shoot down of that rescue helicopter. Oh, yeah. As as they were taking fire and they decided they couldn't stay, and they pulled rather severely up to get out of there, and just as they did, a B-40 rocket went through the bottom of the helicopter and out through the gas tank. And I'm here because it didn't explode. But uh, <laughs> the, the, the crew chief, uh, the, the helicopters actually had just been hay from Da Nang. 
they, they didn't know where they were going to go. <laughs> they, they, they were shipped ashore, guys. You know, they get supplies from the ships and bring them into shore, and suddenly they're in Laos. But the, uh, the uh, yeah, the, the crew chief was looking toward the, the front, and gasoline, Avgas, was coming down, and I banged him on the shoulder, and he looked at me like, what? And, I, and, and through his visor, I could see his eyes go, and we limped about maybe 10 clicks, and then we crashed into the North Vietnamese fortifications, but nobody was home. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> yes, just another day in SOG, in the Secret War. <laughs> so uh, on day three, uh, Captain McCarley continued to move. They moved. They've, uh, uh, also, on the first day, they got into an enemy cache. They destroyed tons of enemy ordnance, weapons, uh, codes, and other and food supplies. On the fourth day, they moved all night again. On the Wednesday, on the third day, that night they took us. They had a couple of breaks again. Spectres surrounded them. In the morning, they found another enemy headquarters and a cache. They went in, and uh, oh, in the first one. This is one of these funny scenes where they had a telephone, an NVA telephone. The telephone rang. One of the SF guys picked it up. Fifth Special Forces Group, can we help you? <laughs> one of those little moments in time. <laughs> on, the, uh, on the fourth day, they hit another enemy headquarters. And because um, the enemy is so busy bringing troops in, are we that close? Okay, um, so the enemy is now coming with greater strength. Gene McCarley and his men have got the undivided attention of the NVA, but they went in, they hit this cache, they got reams of intelligence out of there, including a picture of Ho Chi Minh. And on, on my book, Saw Chronicle, we got a picture of them holding, there's three the guys from the mission holding the uh, picture. <laughs> A little self-service here, but anyway, the museum is selling the books, and there's some out front. We'll be glad to sign them for you. But that's one of those tokens that was taken. But uh, things got real serious real quick. They destroyed all the enemy cache. They destroyed the food, the weapons, and then they had planned to go for another two days if they could. Covey said, "The weather's closing in, and we can see hundreds, if not thousands, of NVA coming your way." It's time. This mission's done. You're going home. So they get to an LZ, take the wounded with them. The first the CH-53 comes in, took the one-third of the troops out. The second one came in, more gunfire this time, more enemy activity on the aircraft, but they get out. The third one comes in, lands. They load them up. They put the intel in there, and... Um, the enemy activity was so severe that before the CH-53 came in, one of the Sky Raiders came in with CS gas. And that gas hit the enemy, and it makes it as tear gas, basically. But they use it uh, with the ordnance so that when it hits, the enemy becomes disoriented. And, you know, if you're, you're fighting, all of a sudden you get the tear gas, and that tear gas combined with the, the tactics of the men on the ground and then the CH-53 came in, there's still some of the tear gas around, and the NVA were literally chasing those guys into the helicopter. And Gene McCarley, remember, he and Mike Rose were the last two, the medic, were the last two up the tail, and they're standing there shooting the NVA as they're coming up at him. But they could have thrown a hand grenade. To this day, nobody knows why they didn't just throw a hand grenade in. And then also, right before Gene had gotten on the aircraft, an indigenous soldier next to him was shot in the head and killed instantly. So that's how intense the combat was. They get into the helicopter, it takes off, they're getting hammered with uh, enemy fire. They get a few hundred feet off the ground, one of the Marine Corps door gunners got shot in the neck and the blood is up, squirting up to the ceiling. Mike gets over, patches this guy up, and he tells him, you're not going to die. If you're going to die, you would have been dead already. So he sounds a little cruel, but 
They woke the guy up, stabilized him. He saved his life, kept him alive, and the helicopter is now rising up, getting more hits from enemy weapons fire. They get over the first mountain, the first engine, it's a two engine helicopter. The first engine goes out. Now we got a CH-53 Delta with one engine, loaded with men, weapons, and there's never been any training for that kind of a mission. We have a helicopter full with troops. They go over the second mountain, and the second engine goes out. And the pilot goes, mayday, mayday. He's hoping to hear from some of his fellow aviators about, like, okay, we'll find you an LZ somewhere. There was radio silence. The pilot just barely got over the mountain. He began to rotate. All the rotation is when the helicopter has enough wind to keep the propellers up so it won't crash. And so the energy, the wind, and the aircraft moving forward keep the air aircraft moving as opposed to dropping out of the sky like a stone. The pilot saw a little small opening, but it had some water. And he knew that Mike had wounded people on board. He didn't want to land in the water, fearing they would drown. So there was next to it, there was like a little slanted area. He came in with that CH-53, landed hard, it, it rolled, and it landed with such impact that it ejected several of the people from the helicopter. The impact was so severe that Captain Gene McCarley's teeth were crushed. It took him over two years to get his teeth fully repaired after that crushing moment. Gene, Mike Rose, several others were ejected from the helicopter. Both of them were knocked unconscious. When they came up, regained consciousness, Gene McCarley had one of these really unique moments in time. Keep in mind, he'd just been in the jungle for four days. They crash landed. He had been knocked out. He wakes up with his teeth all crushed. And he looks out, his first sergeant is standing in a puddle of water, like a lake. And there was sand around. And Gene goes, what am I seeing? <laughs> he couldn't believe it. Here's Laos. There was a water, like a lake, a small lake or something. And his first sergeant standing with a big, shitty and grin on his face. When I talked to him, I said, what were you grinning about? He says, no, I don't know. I had my bell rung. Maybe I was just happy to be alive. <laughs> But here it was in Laos with white sand, water. They survived. Um, they quickly gathered, emptied the aircraft. Um, one of the pilots had been injured. They took care of him. The next bird came in and lifted them out. And um, like Mike Rose, I said, was the uh, sole medic on that mission. He had his indigenous troop with him. And on last past, October uh, 23rd, he received the Medal of Honor at the White House. And some, some of us were there, Doc was there, and we were all there for that moment to troll Spider and a few others for that moment in time. Took a little while to get it, but he got it. He earned it the hard way. So on that note, we'll come back. Yes. Got a couple of requests. Uh, yeah, thank you. This, this doesn't get any better uh, just out winging this stuff. Uh, first of all, uh, people who have passes are ready to go back and eat. They cannot accommodate everybody on the first pass, so a group of you may not be able to seat right away. But uh, it's in the very back of the museum uh, where they had uh, storage materials. It's, it's our uh, salad bar type lunch. So. We'd like some of you to go. The pilots, I'd like to have all the pilots that flew A1s to uh, come out for a picture. So delay just a little bit. That'll help with that flow. Uh, and uh, Tom uh, wants to take a photo of us out at the airplane. And I'm sure that Rich would like that too. Uh, yes, sir. We're also ready uh, when you guys come back in if anybody wanted to start their year. Because, okay. Uh, and are you going to be, where are you going to be set up for the interview? Okay. Okay. So if you get out of lunch early and you want to do a little talking with uh, the photography guys, please do that. After lunch, I don't know yet. 
<laughs> uh, we may crank up with some more stuff, uh, the, the flying, and we're going to definitely do Long Vey, and I'm also wanted to get uh, Brian Silcox a uh, little time too to show us some of his photo work that he does. So we have plenty of things to do here, and then uh, we'll, we'll pass for that. So I'm guessing the lunch uh, be about an hour and a half to maybe hour 15 minutes, probably hopefully closer to 1.30, what time is it now? I'm, yeah. So let's just see how it goes and we'll wing it. So please all the uh, aviators uh, come on out and get a photograph. You have your insight, have me insight. Shot on three, King 27 has your bingo this time. Okay, I'm gonna fly down the river, down the river. Tell me when I'm over your location, over your location. A bit longer until uh, Alamo 2 gets in a little bit of shape. Yeah, I'm going to another five minutes early. Okay, so we'll hold another five minutes. Go ahead. Uh, sure, keep everybody high and back there. Uh, the IP. Uh, register, I'm going to have one, two, I'm sorry. Okay, baby, how far was I? Was I right over you? Was I right over you? Stand by one, stand by one. I'm going to take another cut at you. Give me a call when I'm right over you. Okay, two, is that you over there? Yes, yeah, so that was location for